Hi everyone, welcome to your flipped pedigrees video. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how to build and identify pedigrees for certain conditions. Um, you're, and, and actually College Board, the, their wording is you're gonna construct um, these representations. And what we're gonna be doing is looking at pedigrees for the autosomal dominant, the autosomal recessive, and sex link trait. We're gonna take each one of them one at a time by drawing a column right down in between them. So we'll have three columns on our page starting with that autosomal dominant trait. So with the autosomal dominant trait, you only need one copy of the allele. So it can be A blank. So either A, big A, big A, or big A, little A. In other words, homozygous dominant or heterozygous for this condition. You're gonna see examples of these in class, such as a chondroplastic dwarfism, uh, Huntington's chorea, or even sometimes polydactyly, which is when a person is born with an extra finger or toe. And so for all of these, what we're going to do is we're going to start with just kind of a basic sketch of a pedigree, identifying certain characteristics. So in our first, the first thing we're going to point out is that in this example, um, the squares are going to represent the male and the circles are going to represent females. So these are the, uh, the parents that we are starting from in this family tree. And we're going to call this the P generation. So P stands for parents. And then what we're going to do is we're going to track and look for characteristics um, of, of these traits and how so that you can look at one and identify what it is. Then in class, what we'll do is we'll start use, applying mathematical probability to this um, in addition to identifying these conditions. So we have our male and a female. And for this example, we're going to make it simple. We're just going to draw two offspring. Let's go ahead and just draw a male, so in other words, a son and a daughter, and this is going to be our F1 generation. So the first generation um, from this parent, these parents that we're looking at. Each one of these individuals is also going to produce offspring. And one of the things that we do is we show horizontal lines represents um, either a marriage or at least the production of offspring. So these two here, this mom and dad are married, indicated by that horizontal line, and then the, the, the lines coming down off of this horizontal branch, even though it's, it's horizontal here, but this horizontal branch indicates the children of this marriage. So these, these folks are gonna get married. Let's say they have two children each. We're just gonna keep it pretty simple for the sake of these pedigrees. Okay, now, in order to recognize something as a dominant trait, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna shade in the individuals that are affected. So, um, in this case, in this example, our shaded individuals are affected by whatever trait that we are tracking. Now, one of the ways that you're going to know that a trait is autosomal dominant, um, the clue that you're looking for is that with autosomal dominant, there, it doesn't skip generations. So we're going to draw the father is affected, but the mother's unaffected. So the mother is recessive for the trait, but the father is affected. We don't know if he is homozygous dominant or if he's heterozygous. We just know that he has the trait. That means he's going to pass it on to his children. So this young man is affected, as is this young lady. Now, that means that it's also going to be passed on to the next generation as well. But keep in mind that we don't know whether he is homozygous dominant or, or heterozygous. So it is possible that some of the children, or in this case, the grandchildren in F2, are unaffected if the parents were heterozygous for the condition. So the reason why we can color this one in um, is because the, the mother is little a, little a, and the father must be big A, little a, because the only way that this child could in, be recessive is if she inherited one of the A's from her mother and she inherited the little a from her father. So then we would also know that this individual had to inherit one of the A's from his mother and inherited the big A from the father. That's the only way that this person could be 
uh, the only the only thing option that this could be is heterozygous because they didn't inherit a large A from the mother. So when you're looking at these, you always want if you want to identify something as autosomal dominant, um, it doesn't skip generations. That's one of the things that you look for. So between P, F1, F2, F3, you're always going to see at least one shaded individual. Um, and that's, that's your big key. That's, your, that's one of your big key things that you're looking at is, um, are, is it showing up in every generation? All right. The next one we're going to look at is autosomal recessive disorder. And in this case, they both need to be, both alleles need to be, sorry, both alleles need to be recessive. So um, in other words, homozygous recessive. And typically we write that as lowercase, lowercase. And I'm going to use the letter A as an example. Um, again, we're going to do a pedigree. And what you guys are going to be looking at in class are some examples of sickle cell anemia. You're going to be looking at um, cystic fibrosis. So there's some common human genetic disorders. But we can also go ahead and look at um, hip dysplasia, which is common in many breeds of dogs. Let's just say that they have two. All right, so here's my generic tree. I drew the parents, my F1, and my F2. So those are the three generations of this family. And with recessive traits, what happens many times is that you're going to notice that it does skip a generation. So this time, what we're going to do is our individual who's affected, our shaded individual, is going to be the mother. So she is A, A. Little A, little A. The father we know is big A, but we don't know what the second trait is. He could either be homozygous dominant or hom homozygous recessive. When you look at the next offspring, when you look at the... Um, at the next generation of offspring, um, we'll see that nobody else is affected. But what we're gonna do to help us in this case, we're gonna go ahead and shade in in the F2 to show what it looks like when we say it skips generation. So it's in P1, no individuals of the, off, no individuals of the parents, that's what you gotta look for, not the marriage, but the parents, none of the individuals of the offspring of the parents ha are affected, but then you see it in these ones' grandchildren. So we know that all of these individuals, because they're unaffected, they are capital A. We just don't know what the second letter in their genotype is. Now, when you look at this individual, the marriage by marriage, we also know that they're capital A. And when you look at their offspring, they have an individual who is recessive. So the only way that this individual could be recessive is if they inherited a small a from their father and a small a from their mother. So um, that's the only way that that individual can have the recessive offspring um, is if they inherited those from the parents. So um, these people typically um, may not have the symptoms of the disease, but they're able to produce children uh, with the, the disease or the disorder. The last one we're going to look at is the sex linked. This is going to be the X or Y chromosome. So this is like male pattern baldness, uh, color blindness, hemophilia. It's traits that follow on the X or the Y chromosome. So when you uh, draw your tree, let's go ahead and draw three children. Um, and we'll draw spouses for these ones. This one's not married and, and having kids yet. I'm gonna draw. All right, so for sex-linked, what you're looking for 
Um, number one, that it, it can skip generations. When we do this, um, so we have our P1, our P, F1, and F2. So here are my three generations. It can skip. Typically, we're going to draw our males shaded. And we'll go ahead and draw, in this case, all the offspring shaded. Okay. The thing with sex-linked chromosomes, you need to remember that if, if the individual is male, they are going to inherit an X and a Y chromosome. And the way that you denote that it's sex-linked is a little mark on the X chromosome itself. So this person is affected. Male, male pattern baldness, colorblind, hemophilia, doesn't matter. With females, what happens many times is that even if she has one that is affected, she has the second X chromosome, which doesn't have the mutation to back up and prevent any symptoms of the disorder. So the female is a carrier, but she is not affected. The only way, um, the only way that she is going to be affected is if she inherits the X chromosome with the mutation from her father and she inherits one from the mother. Males can't do this because they don't have that second X chromosome. They just have a Y chromosome in, instead. So in the case of the female who is uh, a carrier, um, she has one chromosome that is, that's producing normal genes or has a normal gene. The other one that is, wow, I spelled this so wrong, female. Let's try that again. Sorry about that. And then if she is affected, then both her X chromosomes will um, have the mutation. And in that case, in this case, she has a 50-50 chance of passing it to her offspring. In the case of the males, or in the case of sons, 100% of her sons will have the trait, the sex link trait. All right. Sorry this video ran long. Hope it helps, and we'll see you guys in class.